mental, that one. I'm telling you. Hollywood is certainly not the easiest industry out there. We have all watched different actors go from a hit one day to a flop the next. Curious to know why that happens? Let's find out. I'm just, I don't know. I don't understand. Um, how this happened. <laughs> Number 10, David Schwimmer. The 57-year-old actor was born in Flushing, Queens, but following his mother's successful career as a divorce lawyer, his family would later relocate to Los Angeles when he was 10 years old. The family settled in Beverly Hills, and Schwimmer attended Beverly Hills High School as a result. Among his classmates was actor Jonathan Silverman. Schwimmer admitted to feeling like an outsider during his time at the school. He could not quite get used to life in Beverly Hills. That is until he ventured into drama class and participated in stage productions one of which was portraying the fairy godmother in a Jewish adaptation of Cinderella. In 1979, he attended a Shakespearean workshop led by English actor Sir Ian McKellen in Los Angeles. This was an experience that deeply resonated with him. Schwimmer also competed in the Southern California Shakespeare Festival for three consecutive years. He even secured the first prize twice. Encouraged by his school drama teacher to pursue acting further, Schwimmer attended a summer acting program at Northwestern University in Chicago. He would later describe this experience as enlightening and exhilarating. Upon graduating from Beverly Hills High in 1984, Schwimmer initially desired to pursue acting immediately, but his parents urged him to attend college first as a backup plan. Consequently, he enrolled in Northwestern University, where he had previously attended the summer acting program. At Northwestern, he studied theater and was part of an improv group with Stephen Colbert, known as the No Fun Mud Piranhas. After earning a Bachelor of Arts degree in theater and speech in 1988, Schwimmer co-founded the Looking Glass Theater Company. He then returned to Los Angeles to pursue an acting career. Throughout the late 1980s, he resided in Los Angeles and struggled as an aspiring actor. He remained unemployed until his breakthrough role in the 1989 TV movie A Deadly Silence. But it wasn't until his outstanding portrayal as Ross in the now iconic 1994 show Friends that he truly made a name for himself. In the early 1990s, he was featured in other television shows such as L.A. Law, The Wonder Years, NYPD Blue, and Monty. Following the conclusion of Friends in 2004, Schwimmer diversified into film and stage productions. He portrayed Dwayne Hopwood in the 2005 drama film, lent his voice to Mel Man the Giraffe in the Madagascar animated film series, and starred in Big Nothing in 2006 and Nothing But the Truth in 2008. His stage endeavors included leading roles in Some Girls, 2005, and the Kane Mutiny Court Martial on Broadway 2006. In 2007, he made his directorial debut with the comedy titled Run Fat Boy Run and ventured into off-Broadway direction in Fault Lines the next year. But somehow, none of this really mattered. While portraying the role so well, David Schwimmer probably would have never guessed that he would become synonymous with Ross Geller. With his impeccable humor and establishing himself as a beloved comedic talent, he played a pivotal role in anchoring the Friends series. Despite delving into drama with Band of Brothers, Ross Geller just seemed to be a part of David Schwimmer. No matter how hard you tried, you couldn't just shake it off, right? Fans knew it, and sadly, producers and casting directors knew it too. Very amusing. Isn't it a funny song? Thank you for your rendition. Number 9. Jack Gleason. Born on May 20, 1992 in Cork, Ireland, Gleason grew up in Ranelagh, Dublin. There, he attended Gonzaga College. He has two older sisters named Rachel and Emma, who are also notably active in the Irish theater scene. Gleason had joined drama classes with them at a young age and actively participated in youth theater as well. He was also involved in the independent theater workshops in Klonsky. From 2010 to 2015, Gleason pursued his education at Trinity College, Dublin. While studying philosophy and theology, he was elected a scholar at the university in 2012. During his time at Trinity, Gleason was a member of DU Players. It was there that he crossed paths with his future collaborators who would establish the Collapsing Horse Theatre Company. But at what point did he really get into acting? You see, Gleason's acting journey commenced much earlier at the age of 8 through the Independent Theatre Workshop. While pursuing his academics, Gleason still managed to land his first roles in films such as Reign of Fire in 2002. From there, he made appearances in Batman Begins in 2005, Shrooms in 2007, and A Shine of Rainbows in 2009. 
In 2010, he took on a leading role in All Good Children, earning recognition as the Pix Big Discovery by the reviewer for Variety magazine. However, none of these roles could match up to that of Joffrey Baratheon in the HBO series Game of Thrones. When we first met the character of Joffrey in 2011, and for who he was supposed to be, Gleason did a good job portraying him. Gleason once credited Joachim Phoenix's portrayal of Commodus in Gladiator as an influence on his performance as Joffrey Baratheon. While still a part of the Game of Thrones franchise in the early 2010s, Gleason still actively participated as a company member in Dublin's Collapsing Horse Theatre. Remember, this is the company he co-founded and produced. He was also part of the original cast in the company's inaugural theatre production, Monster Clock, a children's theatre show that premiered in Dublin in 2010. By 2013, Gleason had already begun hinting at an intention to retire from acting after completing his role in Game of Thrones. He is aiming to pursue an academic career as a reason for this move. Subsequently, in 2014, Gleason officially retired from acting following his work on Game of Thrones. However, in an interview, he revealed a shift in his plans, indicating a change of heart regarding academia. It was at this point that fans made the connection. There was just no taking the insufferable Joffrey away from Gleason. In 2019, Gleason went on to make two notable public appearances. In June, he was featured in the musical comedy program A Musical at the Kilkenny Cat Laughs Comedy Festival in Kilkenny, Ireland. Then later in August, he surprised audiences with an appearance at Over the Top Wrestling's Trinity Brawl 2 event in Dublin. He took on the persona of TV's Jack Gleason and faced off against Irish wrestler Jay Money. Even in 2020, Gleason returned to television screens in Sarah Pascoe's series Out of Her Mind. Still, some people barely even remember his real name. It's always the Isn't That Joffrey Wherever He Goes? Even a quick Wikipedia search identifies Jack Leeson as the actor behind the character Joffrey Baratheon in the HBO television series Game of Thrones. But is it really so hard to imagine why? We mean, Joffrey is arguably one of television's most memorable villains. Everybody hated him, and that's largely because Jack Leeson's portrayal of Joffrey in Game of Thrones was nothing short of exemplary. His depiction of the petulant and cruel young king captivated and appalled audiences alike. So yes, Gleason's tenure on Game of Thrones definitely defined his career. Even his decision to take a hiatus from acting post-show could not help his case. Next is the child star who carried the memorable 1990s sitcom line, Did I do that? Did I do that? Number 8. Jalil White Jalil White portrayed Steve Urkel, the quirky yet lovable neighbor who captured the hearts of audiences. White's portrayal of Steve Urkel transcended the confines of the show and propelled him to widespread fame. There is no doubt that he emerged as the standout personality of the series. Even better, he evolved into a cultural phenomenon that was synonymous with pop culture at the time. Born on November 27, 1976, in Culver City, California, Jalil White is the only child of Michael and Gail White. Notably, his mother, Gail, would assume the role of his manager. He attended John Marshall Fundamental High School and South Pasadena High School before earning his degree from UCLA in 2001. But of course, somewhere in all of his academic pursuits, White became a TV star. Upon the suggestion of his preschool teacher, White embarked on his acting journey at a young age. He made his debut in TV commercials at just three years old. Among his notable commercial appearances was one for Jell-O Pudding Pops alongside Bill Cosby. But despite a few minor roles, White's breakthrough didn't occur until his portrayal of Urkel. At the age of 12, White rose to fame with his iconic portrayal of Steve Urkel on Family Matters. He also portrayed various members of the Urkel family, including his alter ego Stefan Urquell and Myrtle Urkel. In addition to his on-screen performances, White contributed to the series as a writer. He penned down several episodes, including one that became the highest rated for the year when he was just 19 years old. Family Matters stood out as one of the longest-running sitcoms that featured a predominantly black cast in television history. The show became a cornerstone of ABC's TGIF lineup, and one could argue that Urkel was the character who truly carried the show. Capitalizing on the show's popularity, an Urkel-themed breakfast cereal known as Urkel O's and dolls were marketed. Wouldn't you say it takes a special kind of character to get their very own cereal? Urkel was just that iconic. Interestingly, the role was initially conceived as a one-time guest appearance. However, Urkel's immediate popularity led to White becoming a regular fixture on the show. Family Matters aired for nine seasons, from 1989 to 1998. In 1992, White showcased his versatility in the Jalil White special, portraying a fictionalized version of himself navigating the filmmaking process while also embodying the character of Steve Urkel. White was 21 years old when the series concluded in 1998. 
As you can imagine, White found himself disenchanted with the role of Urkel. In a 1999 interview, he expressed a strong aversion to revisiting the character. In his own words, if you ever see me do that character again, take me out and put a bullet in my head and put me out of my misery. It goes without saying that White struggled to escape the shadows of Urkel's immense popularity. He encountered difficulty any time he tried securing other roles. Even when he managed to pop up in projects like Psych, House, and Fake It Till You Make It, you almost would not recognize him. However, in later years, White reconciled with the character. In a 2011 interview with Vanity Fair, he addressed the infamous bullet quote explaining, it's unfortunate how quotes can be taken out of context. White explained that he loved playing the Urkel characters. He was just maturing and felt he needed to break away from it so he could showcase his personal growth. True to this interview, White reprised his role as Urkel for the first time in 21 years for the 2019 series Scooby-Doo and Guess Who. I believe no permanent damage was done. What happened? The occipital area of my head seems to have impacted with the arm of the chair. Number 7. Leonard Nimoy His iconic portrayal of Spock began with the February 1964 Star Trek television pilots, The Cage, and Where No Man Has Gone Before. This was followed by eight feature films and guest appearances in spin-offs. During 1967 to 1970, Nimoy also pursued a music career with Dot Records. He released albums primarily as Spock. Leonard Simon Nimoy was born on March 26, 1931, in an Irish section of Boston, Massachusetts, to Jewish immigrants from Isel Isis Isislav, to Jewish immigrants from Isislav, Ukraine. His parents had fled separately from Isislav, but eventually reunited in the United States. His father went on to establish a barbershop in Boston. As a young boy, Nimoy took on various odd jobs in an attempt to supplement his family's income. He sold newspapers, greeting cards, and even shined shoes. As he grew older, he ventured into sales of vacuum cleaners and assisted in theater setups. At this point, his parents favored a traditional path of higher education and stable careers, but his grandfather encouraged him to pursue his developing passion for acting. As such, he actively participated in the children's local theater productions. At 17, Nimoy landed his first significant role as Ralphie in an amateur production of Clifford Odette's Awake and Sing. Now, this was a role that Nimoy would later admit was reminiscent of his own upbringing. Nimoy fully kicked off his acting journey in his early 20s. He started off by teaching acting classes in Hollywood, but still managed to make minor appearances in films and television shows throughout the 1950s. By 1953, he served as a staff sergeant in the Special Services Division of the United States Army. Up until he completed his service in 1955, he contributed to entertainment initiatives within the military. Nimoy gained widespread recognition for his portrayal of the half-human, half-Vulcan character named Spock. From the inception of the Star Trek TV series in 1966 until his appearance in the film Star Trek Into Darkness in 2013, Spock was a strong and lasting presence in Nimoy's career. Revered for his composed demeanor, intellect, and ability to conquer any challenge, Nimoy's popularity as Spock endured. By emerging as one of the most iconic alien characters in television history, he nearly overshadowed even the series' lead, William Shatner's Captain Kirk. Considering the role earned him three Emmy Award nominations, Nimoy's portrayal of Spock no doubt left a lasting cultural imprint. At some point, he transitioned to supporting roles in projects like Gunsmoke, The Eleventh Hour, and The Untouchables, but none would rival his iconic portrayal of Spock. In fact, his association with Spock was so profound that it inspired two autobiographies, in 1975, he released I Am Not Spock. This book highlighted the challenges of being typecast as well as the impact on his career. By 1995, he must have embraced his Spock persona as he released another biography book titled I Am Spock. This time, he acknowledged its profound influence on his life and his dedicated fans. Next is an actor who shared a striking narrative with his on-screen persona. Number 6. Peter Ostrom Born on November 1, 1957 in Dallas, Texas, Peter Ostrom is an American retired veterinarian and former child actor. Technically, child actor is a bit of a stretch because Ostrom would rather describe himself as a child who acted. Ever wondered what happened to the lovable actor who portrayed the role of Charlie Bucket in the 1971 Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Well, here is your answer. You see, Ostrom was 12 years old when he was discovered by talent agents. He was performing at the Cleveland Playhouse Children's Theater in the sixth grade when he caught the attention of talent agents who were conducting a nationwide search for the role of Charlie Bucket. After taking Polaroid photos of Ostrom, they recorded him reading from the original novel and returned to New York. 
Two months later, Ostrom was called to New York for a screen test, during which he performed My Country, Tis of Thee. Approximately a month later, he received a call informing that he had 10 days to prepare for filming. Ostrom quickly departed from Munich in August 1970, and the rest, of course, is history. As outstanding as he was at being Charlie Bucket, this was his last film role. While he actually enjoyed the filmmaking experience, Ostrom chose not to commit to a three-film contract after the Willy Wonka film wrapped up. This actor chose to turn away from a career in film and theater and initially chose not to speak about it. In fact, Ostrom was offered a three-film contract by the studios, but his decision to decline led to his exit from the acting profession. By 1990, he kicked off an annual tradition of speaking to schoolchildren about the film. By January 2018, Ostrom would finally speak about his decision to leave the Hollywood scene. He mentioned that he occasionally missed acting. He just preferred to take the easy way out and not go through the pressures of transitioning from child to adult actor. Considering he still receives royalty payments from the film every three months, this might just be a win. So when you think back at how Charlie Bucket took a chance to explore the eccentric candy inventor's factory, you will find that it is not so different from the real-life narrative of Peter Ostrom, who ventured into the competitive world of professional acting. Both individuals were fortunate to enter unfamiliar domains and managed to find contentment thereafter. He eventually became a veterinarian and still appears to be living a fulfilling life with his family. Despite his short run, we believe there is little doubt that Ostrom left a lasting impression in the industry. Okay, that's good, that's good. Um, up high, up high. Five low. <laughs> Too slow. <laughs> Number five, Edward Furlong. Edward Walter Furlong was born August 2, 1977 in Glendale, California. He never had any aspirations for acting until casting agent Molly Finn approached him in September 1990. She was on the lookout for a young actor to portray John Connor in one of the most successful box office hits of the 1990s, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. She was visiting the Pasadena Boys and Girls Club when she saw Furlong, and she just knew she had her star. Very confident that he could hold his own opposite Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton, she suggested him for the role. You would agree that Furlong's performance in Terminator 2 was a career-launching role, right? We mean the MTV Movie Award for Best Breakthrough Role and a Saturn Award for Best Young Actor is proof that it was. From that point, he made his way through Hollywood by collaborating with renowned figures in both studio and independent films. Furlong followed this success with a series of notable performances in both mainstream and independent cinema. He shared the screen with esteemed actors such as Meryl Streep and Liam Neeson in the 1996 film Before and After. He also worked alongside Tim Roth, Maximilian Schell, and Vanessa Redgrave in Little Odessa. Even earlier in 1993, Furlong was featured in Aerosmith's music video for Living on the Edge. He portrayed the lead role of a horror and video game obsessed teen in the sci-fi genre. Notably, Furlong kept the performances rolling. He starred along Edward Norton in the acclaimed drama American History 10 in 1998. That same year, he also featured in the popular comedy Pecker. While some argue that he saw success in American History 10, surely you could agree that Furlong was unable to sustain his early achievements. He appeared in the prison drama titled Animal Factory in the year 2000. Furlong was certainly working, but for some reason it just wasn't happening. Try as he might, Furlong's career saw a significant decline from the year 2000. For one, many of his subsequent films bypassed the theaters and headed straight to DVD releases. In 2001, he took on a role in another lesser-known film titled The Knights of the Quest by Italian director Pupi Avati. You can see how it just kept on getting worse. Unfortunately, it would get even more tragic when the media caught wind of his problems with drug addiction. Despite initial expectations that Furlong would reprise his role as John Connor in Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines in 2003, fans were left shocked. Nick Stahl was cast as John Connor just before filming commenced. It is believed that news of his struggles with drug addiction had already been circulating. Later in 2012, allegations surfaced in court documents that showed Furlong was still struggling with his addiction. His ex-wife accused him of having a hand in their six-year-old son testing positive for cocaine. This resulted in supervised visitations ordered by a judge. In 2021, he would admit that he finally got himself together and was celebrating three years of being sober. In spite of his struggles, Furlong kept on acting up until 2015, where he worked on an episode of Star Wars Renegade. But if you have been paying attention, it is clear as day that he had not been able to replicate the level of success he got from his breakout role as John Connor in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Next is an actor who found himself playing the role of his dreams. You do it then if you're so clever. Go on, go on. Oh God, you... See here, everyone. This great has done it. <laughs> Number 4. Rupert Grint 
Rupert Alexander Lloyd Grant was born on August 24, 1998 in Harlow, Essex, England. He is the eldest child of Joanne Parsons and Nigel Grant, who specialized in memorabilia. Among his four siblings, Rupert has one brother and three sisters. Growing up in Hedfordshire, just north of London, Rupert lived in close proximity to Leavesden Film Studios. This made it convenient for potential acting opportunities. Before landing his role in the Harry Potter films, he attended Richard Hale Secondary School in Hertford. In school, he actively participated in school plays, including portraying Rumpelstiltskin in the Brothers Grimm fairy tales. Additionally, he regularly attended weekend drama classes at Top Hat Stage School in Hetford. He continued his passion for acting as he progressed through secondary school. Despite his involvement in school productions, Rupert had not pursued acting professionally. However, this changed after his involvement in the Harry Potter series. In 1999, casting commenced for the film adaptation of J.K. Rowling's best-selling novel, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Now, Rowling had been adamant that the cast must be British, so he collaborated with casting director Susie Figgis and director Chris Columbus in the selection process. Grant was already an avid fan of the book series, so he auditioned for the role of Ron Weasley, none other than Harry Potter's loyal friend at Hogwarts. Luckily, he caught the attention of the casting team. He sent in a video of himself rapping about his desire to secure the role. After a few meetings, Grant was eventually chosen alongside Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson to portray Ron, Harry, and Hermione, respectively. Making his screen debut in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone in 2001, Grant was shot to international fame. The film shattered records for opening day sales and weekend takings. In fact, it became the highest-grossing film of the year. With a staggering theatrical run grossing $974 million, it remains one of the most commercially successful entries in the series. Grant's performance earned him a lot of recognition. This included a Satellite Award for Outstanding New Talent and a Young Artist Award for Most Promising Young Newcomer. Continuing his role as Ron Weasley, Grint reprised his character in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets a year later. Expanding his repertoire beyond the Harry Potter franchise, Grint ventured into other projects. This included a leading role in Thunderpants starting in 2002. He later starred in the comedy drama titled Driving Lessons in 2006, then came roles in Cherry Bomb in 2009 and Wild Target in 2010. Following the conclusion of the Harry Potter series, he appeared in various films such as Into the White 2012, Charlie Countryman 2013, CBGB 2013, and Moonwalkers in 2015. By 2013, he made his stage debut in Moho at the Harold Pinter Theater. He also served as an executive producer and lead actor in the television series Snatch. But despite the subsequent diverse roles, Grint remains indelibly associated with his portrayal of Ron Weasley in the Harry Potter universe. By solidifying his legacy as an integral part of the iconic Harry Potter trio, it is almost impossible to think of him as anything else. If you made it this far, do hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any updates from us. Next, a 90s actress dominated the screen with a single role before disappearing into thin air. Number 3. Alicia Silverstone there is no doubt that Alicia's portrayal of Cher Horowitz in Clueless launched her into the limelight, but as you are about to see, it wasn't enough that she forged a strong bond with younger audiences. Alicia Silverstone was born on October 4, 1976 in San Francisco, California. She is the daughter of Dee Dee Radford, a former flight attendant, and Monty Silverstone, a real estate investor, and is notably the youngest of three children. Alicia's journey in the entertainment industry began at the age of six, her father took some photos of her and somehow she eventually landed on several television commercials. Following a guest appearance on The Wonder Years in 1988 as a literal dream girl, she transitioned to the big screen. She secured her first official role in 1993 in the film titled The Crush. It was a teen-oriented thriller reminiscent of 1987's Fatal Attraction. Alicia played the role of a disturbed young girl fixated on an older man. Although the controversial role didn't impress critics, it did resonate with its target audience. You guessed it teenagers. In fact, her performance earned her the 1994 MTV Movie Award for Best Villain and Breakthrough Performance. It is worth noting that during the filming of the movie, Alicia took steps to become an emancipated minor. She aimed to bypass all the child labor laws that could restrict her working hours. This was the earliest sign that she was dedicated to her craft in the early days, so it was only a matter of time before her hard work paid off. That film might not have made her a household name, but it certainly caught the attention of Aerosmith who brought her on for several of their music videos. In their first collaboration, Cryin' was voted the number one video of all time on MTV. Silverstone quickly became a favorite among MTV viewers, but widespread commercial success remained elusive until 1995, 
when she landed the role of Cher in Amy Heckerling's Clueless. Cher represented a stark contrast to Alicia's character in The Crush. This time, she portrayed a wealthy, naive, yet lovable girl from Beverly Hills navigating love in the 1990s. It certainly helped that she delivered this role amazingly. The film became a massive box office hit, impressing both audiences and critics, as well as showcasing Alicia's talent and appeal. She subsequently secured a lucrative deal with Columbia TriStar worth $10 million. But of course, Alicia Silverstone quite literally fell off the scene. The momentum of her career slowed down after Clueless, so much so that in only recent years that she is seemingly picking up where she left off. Spotting her in Netflix's 2023 crime thriller titled Reptile was an unexpected yet welcome development for her fans. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. Number 2. Elijah Wood Elijah Jordan Wood is an actor who needs no introduction. He is an American actor and producer renowned for his portrayal of Frodo Baggins in the Lord of the Rings film trilogy from 2001 to 2003, as well as The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey in 2012. Wood was born on January 28, 1981 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to Debbie Niekraus and Warren Wood. He comes from a diverse ancestry, including English, Danish, Irish, and German roots. During elementary school, he showcased his acting talent by appearing in productions such as The Sound of Music and assuming the leading role in The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. In 1989, Wood's family, excluding his father, relocated to Los Angeles to support his acting aspirations. Wood made his film debut with a minor role in Back to the Future Part II in 1989. He went on to gain recognition as a childhood actor through various roles, including Avalon in 1990 and The Good Son in 1993. By his teenage years, he took on prominent roles in films such as North in 1994, Flipper in 1996, and The Ice Storm in 1997. These were all notable roles, but his breakthrough came when he portrayed Frodo Baggins in the 2001 film Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. This was the first installment of Peter Jackson's adaptation of J.R.R. Tolkien's epic novel series. Being a fan of the book series himself, Wood submitted an audition tape of himself dressed as Frodo. By delivering lines from the novel, he was swiftly chosen from a pool of 150 actors who auditioned. He was also the first actor to be cast. This granted him top billing alongside a star-studded cast. Following the success of Lord of the Rings, Wood ventured into a diverse array of films. His first role, Pulse Lord of the Rings, was in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind in 2004. In the film, he portrayed the role of Patrick, an unscrupulous lab technician who actively pursued Kate Winslet. He subsequently appeared in Paris, Je Temps, in 2006, and I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore in 2017. Now, these are just some of his other projects, but despite his subsequent varied roles, Elijah Wood will forever be Frodo to most of us. Lastly, que yo vira, Mr. Bean, one, es un Rowan gran Atkinson. comediante inglés llamado Rowan Sebastian Atkinson. Rowan Sebastian Atkinson was born on January 6, 1955, in Consett County, Durham. He was raised on a farm alongside his two older brothers, Rupert and Rodney, so you can say that his early years were rooted in rural life. It was his academic pursuits that led him to Newcastle University and later Oxford University. There, he pursued degrees in electrical engineering, but somewhat in all of that, he crossed paths with screenwriter Richard Curtis. This ignited a partnership in writing and performing comedic acts. Their collaboration yielded not the 9 o'clock news in 1979. In addition to his television work, Atkinson ventured into the world of cinema. He appeared in films like Dead on Time 1983, Pleasure at Her Majesty's 1976, as well as Never Say Never Again in 1983. But of course, none of these were as iconic as the widely loved and recognized character of Mr. Bean in the beloved TV series Mr. Bean. He kicked off Bean's character in 1990 and did so for many years after that. Beyond Bean, Atkinson graced the small screen in other series, such as 1982's Black Adder and Funny Business in 1992. However, none of it quite hit the same. We believe we speak for everyone when we say it's Mr. Bean or no one. Know of any other one-roll wonders? Do let us know your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button. You also can't miss the next video on your screen.